Hello everyone, I'm Linda Sue Park, author and today your keynoter at the Bank Street uh, Book Festival and I uh, really appreciate uh, Bank Street's invitation to speak here today and uh, to pivot to an online format as, as so many of us are having to do these days. Um, I'd like to thank Cynthia Weil and Lizzie Denning of Bank Street and all of you for uh, attending today. I'm really looking forward to sharing with you um, some information about my latest book, Prairie Lotus, published by Clarion Books, HMH. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you now, and the first screen is um, uh, my novels. I've been fortunate to write many books for young readers, and um, I think I have one of the best jobs in the world. Um, I also write picture books for young readers. But of course, today I'm here to talk about one particular book, um, Prairie Lotus. Um, many young readers will know me because of A Single Shard, which won the 2002 Newbery Medal, which is why it has this beautiful golden sticker on it. Um, uh, I have also written two of the 39 Clues books um, published by Scholastic, a popular series in which um, several authors collaborated to write um, series books. Um, and this was a lot of fun for me because I have always wanted to write a series, but at that point I never had, and I didn't, I was kind of scared. I didn't know if I could, if I could write a whole series. And so this book um, is, I only had to write one book in the first series, which is with Storm Warning. So I got to be part of a series, but only had to write one book. And then I wrote uh, um, Trust No One for the second series. And so many young readers um, may not know my other books, but they do know these. So that was a fun way to have um, a, reader, a different readership than my sort of standard readership. Um, after that, I wrote the Wing and Claw Fantasy Trilogy. And um, this is about, uh, it's a pre-technology story about a young apothecary named Rafa. His family makes um, medicines from roots and berries and leaves and things like that. And uh, it's, um, so it's got a touch of magic in it and it's also an animal story. So that was also a lot of fun to me to, for me to write. Um, probably the book that most young readers know me by is this one, A Long Walk to Water, uh, which I wrote collaboratively with a young man named Salva Dut, who was a refugee from what was then the country of Sudan and where Salva comes from is now the newest nation in the world, South Sudan. And it is about his experiences escaping war. And also about a young girl named Nia, who has to walk a long way every day to fetch water for her family. So this book has been used by many, many schools um, for all school reads, for all community reads. And um, I am just really grateful to the uh, teachers and librarians who have introduced Salva's story to young readers. It's one of those books that um, has just seemed to really affect people in, in a lot of wonderful, wonderful ways. So there is of course more information about all of these books on my website, which is just my name, lindasuepark.com. Um, I also, um, I'm not a big social media person, but I do tweet. So uh, you can follow me on Twitter at lindasuepark. And um, again, so Twitter and my website, those are my, um, that's the extent of my, my tech ability. <laughs> and I know lots of authors are a lot better at it than I, than I am, um, but um, that's, that's what I'm doing these days, so. Um, okay, so uh, as I said, today I am going to talk about Prairie Lotus, which was published in uh, March of this year. And the setting is the year 1880, and the main character is a girl named H Hannah. She's 14 years old, and she's half Asian and half white. She and her father have moved to, from California to what the US government at the time called Dakota Territory, and was actually, and is actually, Ocheti Shakawi homeland, the homeland of the Ocheti Shakawi Nation, which is better known by, um, by many of us here in this country as the Sioux Nation, um, in mostly uh, the Dakotas, North and South Dakota, and a few other places nearby there. So they have moved to the town of La Forge, uh, Dakota Territory. Um, the impetus for this book 
um, this book took me a really long time to write. In one sense, it took me 50 years to write. I've been thinking about this story really all my life. And one of the things that was really important for me to do with this story was to dismantle what I think of as the single story of westward expansion. Um, many of you will be familiar with the um, seminal TED Talk by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie called The Danger of the Single Story. And in that she very, the author Ngozi Adichie very eloquently talks about why a single story is a dangerous one. And I think that many, um, that many of, many elements of a country's history often become a single story. And this is a concept that can be difficult to grasp, and yet that I've, I've found that when I talk to young people about it, I found a way that they understand it perfectly. So I'm going to do that with you now, you know, um, and I'm going to demonstrate how I talk about a single story with young readers. So please summon your inner 10 year olds as I, as I do this next part of the presentation. Um, could you all help me out here a little bit? And I want you to imagine a cowboy. When I say cowboy, what kind of picture do you get in your head? Okay. I would like you to conjure a mental image of a cowboy. Okay, everybody got one? Now, please conjure a mental image of a group of cowboys. Okay, maybe all just hanging out together, maybe 10, maybe 20 of them. Okay, is everybody picturing a group of cowboys? All right. I wonder if anybody's cowboys look like this. These are African American cowboys. From the middle of the 1800s until the middle of the 1900s, which is considered the glory years of the American cowboy, one in every four cowboys was black. Not one in 10, not one in 100, one in four. So if you pictured that group of cowboys that I asked you to picture, a whole bunch of them should have been black. And for most of us, I would include myself on this before I started researching, my cowboys would have all been white. We have from books, from Hollywood movies, from popular culture in general, a single story of what a cowboy looks like. Now, the problem with a single story is, if you get a single story, you're getting an incomplete story. Okay? And if a story is incomplete enough, it's actually untrue. It's false. It's a lie. All right, let's try this again. Could you all please picture an American Indian, a Native American? What does an Indian look like when you get a picture in your head? They look like this. This is young Native Americans who have recently won college scholarships. Maybe you got a picture of Indians in some kind of traditional dress. Maybe that's what you were thinking. Okay, here is a picture of some Indians in traditional dress. This is the Cherokee National Children's Choir. They make albums. There's one of their albums covers with, covers with the um, famous singer Rita Coolidge. Okay. This is what some Native Americans look like. But because of Hollywood and many other um, avenues of popular culture, we often get a single story or at least not a very varied story about what an American Indian looks like. All right, one more time. The people we call pioneers or settlers, what did they look like? The people who struck out from their homes and uh, bravely traveled hundreds of miles to try to make new homes in the American Midwest and West. What do pioneers look like? Well, they look like this. And they look like this. And they look like this. 
Now this particular group of settlers, sometimes kids in school do learn about. You learn about the Chinese railway workers who built the railroad um, in the United States from west to east to meet the Irish workers that were building the railroad from east to west and they met in Utah in the 1860s. Okay. So sometimes we do learn about these Chinese railway workers. But after they built the railroad, they didn't just disappear. They settled down and had families of their own, mostly again in the American Midwest and West. So that's what pioneers and settlers look like. And yet, many of us would have gotten a single story of a covered wagon and a log cabin and a white family. A single story, if it's incomplete, can actually be untrue. And most of you have probably already experienced this in your lives. Maybe you've had a disagreement, an argument with a friend or an older sibling or a younger sibling, and you've gone to the person in authority, maybe a parent, and who's going to try to settle this dispute, this argument you're having. And the other person gets to go first. And they tell their story. This is what happened. He did this and they blah, 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 blah. And the person in authority then makes their decision, right, like that, without you getting you to tell your story. Not fair, right? Now, the other person might not even lie, but they tell their story from their point of view, and it would be different in certain ways than the story you would tell. And if the person in authority then makes their decision about punishment or reward or whatever, based on only one person's story, that's a single story and it's actually untrue as far as you're concerned, right? Okay, so we see this in our daily lives a lot, the single story. And the single story is almost always unfair. Right? Okay, so that's how I explain the single story to um, young readers and I've just found that you know quite young they get it they get why the single story is not fair but just in case I also show this video and it's very short so I'm actually going to show it a couple of times okay an event seen from one point of view gives one impression Seen from another point of view, it gives quite a different impression. But it's only when you get the whole picture you can fully understand what's going on. Okay, just one more time. And again, it's something that I find uh, young, uh, my young readers respond to. They're very interested in this video. An event seen from one point of view gives one impression. Seen from another point of view, it gives quite a different impression. But it's only when you get the whole picture you can fully understand what's going on. Okay. Um, here is a map that shows you um, the current states of North and South Dakota, but what was once again called Dakota Territory back in that time. The green shaded regions are what was at the time Ocheri Shikoi homeland or Sioux homeland. And on the map, you can see the different um, bands of the Sioux nation. So Yankton, Dakota, Lakota, and so forth. Those were all different bands of the Ocheri Shikoi. Okay. Gradually, they were moved onto reservations. The United States government and other, and their citizens forced them onto reservations, which are the orange indicated on the map. So you can see how their nation went from a wide expanse, the square and the inset of the map, to these relatively small little orange dots. Okay? And that was accomplished by invasion. And the US government invaded their nations, took over, and forced them through war onto these tiny little plots of land. Okay. So when we think about 
what is often called manifest destiny in our social studies books, right? And the westward expansion of the United States, it's pretty much a single story. It's that the United States was meant to spread from sea to shining sea. It's that um, the, these were brave uh, settlers who struck out and, and uh, you know, made new homes for themselves and so forth. And that is the single story or the single lens that we see this historical event through. And of course, there are other lenses. So uh, with Prairie Lotus, I wanted to try to use a different lens to look at that story. All right, so one of the things that I write about is Hannah's experience in her new town going to school. There are, um, in the author's note, the author's, talk, the author's note talks about how much Laura Ingalls Wilder's little house books meant to me when I was a little girl growing up. And I have found this to be um, very common among immigrants and children of immigrants. Okay. Those books seemed to show us what it meant to be an American. This is how you're an American. Okay. They seemed so sort of quintessentially American, these stories. And I like glommed onto them. There were a few other series like that. Okay. I loved the All of a Kind Family books by Sidney Taylor. I loved the Melody series by Elizabeth Enright. And there were a handful of series like these books that just... Um, um, became sort of, I read them so many times, I read them over and over and over again, and they just became, they be, really became a part of me, like our favorite childhood books do. Even more than that, I used to lie in bed night after night after night, and in my head, make up stories that I realize now were the equivalent of pre-internet fan fiction. I was putting myself in the story, and Laura was my best friend and we were having adventures together. And I wrote story after story after story just for years in my head like this. So for me, the Little House books were not only an incredible reading experience, they're the reason, they're like a huge reason that I became a writer. All right, so we fast forward several years and I'm an adult now and I realize, and I'll back up to this again in a minute, I realized that there are some problems <laughs> with the Little House books, and they are not small problems. They are big problems. And when I started seeing that kind of commentary, you know, online and in articles and so forth, it sort of woke up a part of me that I'd kind of forgotten. There were parts of the Little House books that I hated, even as a child. And I have a very clear memory of, because I was a rereader, knowing when those bits were coming as I was reading them. And I remember, holding the pages together, you know, holding two or three pages together and turning so that I wouldn't have to read those parts. I would skip those parts on rereading, okay? They had mostly to do with Ma's attitude towards Native Americans, which I took very personally, all right? In the stories, she hates them. She's afraid of them. She thinks they're, you know, she just has a terrible opinion of them. And I would not have been able to articulate this as a child, but what that meant to me was that in my imaginings, I was Laura's best friend. And Ma's attitude towards Native Americans, what that meant to me was she would never have let me even get near Laura. I have dark hair and dark eyes and darker skin, like a Native American. And I don't think Ma, I think Ma would have crossed the street if she had seen me. I don't think she would have let me anywhere near Laura, right? So those parts were painful to me and I would skip them. I didn't even think about the greater implications for Native Americans back then. I took it very personally. But then it was, you know, years later that I realized these problems were not only personal, but hugely global, you know, to entire nations of people. What do I do with that? There were people, scholars, teachers, librarians, who were able to say, okay, I'm done. I'm done with the Little House books, okay? I'm not gonna recommend them. I'm not going to, they're not in my canon anymore, which is what I think should happen. I think they should be, you know, in archives. But that was very difficult for me, again, because they were so bound up in my actual writer's DNA, okay? So for years, I 
I was trying to figure this out. I was actually, you know, wrestling with what was quite a painful problem with me. What do you do with, with uh, something that you loved so much as a child that so much is part of your identity? And I finally decided that I would try to, I would try to write something. And as I began it, I realized that I had been waiting for books, for a book like this. And we got it in some form. We got it in Birch, the Birchbark House series by Louise Erdrich, which is contemporaneous with the Little House books, but is from the native point of view. And um, I mean, those books are incredible books. And I think they should be in every classroom and that, and that they should be part of every curriculum. Um, but what they didn't do was um, um, put myself, me, myself, as an Asian immigrant into the stories. And so that's what I wanted to do with Prairie Lotus. All right, so we see a um, one-room classroom. On the left is the replica of the schoolhouse where um, Laura Ingalls Wilder taught in um, little, uh, these happy golden years, okay, in the last book in the Little House series. She taught in a one-room classroom. And it's a replica of that in what is now Desmet, South Dakota. And um, the, this is, the interior is not that in the interior of that building because I wanted a clearer picture and I couldn't find a clear picture of, I mean, I went there myself and my pictures did not turn out well. So this is a, a different one room classroom, but it has some elements that I wanted to show, that I like to show young readers when I'm talking about this book, that this would have been a K through 12 classroom with all the grades in one room, the stove in the middle to keep the room warm in the winter time. And at the front of the stove, you can see a water bucket and a dipper. Okay, so that would have been filled with water for the children to have a, a drink during the day when they got thirsty. And that exact kind of water bucket and dipper is in Prairie Lotus and is, um, you know, figures in the plot of the story when um, Hannah begins to be bullied by her classmates when she attends school. So, um, it, it, it might help some readers who are visual thinkers to picture Hannah in this kind of classroom as they are, as they are reading the book. Um, Hannah wants to grow up, uh, wants to finish school and help out in her father's dry goods shop. Okay, so this is a dry goods shop or a dress goods shop um, in the right era, in the 18, this is actually 1890s, but it's not Dakota Territory. Once again, the best interior shot I could find to give you an idea of what these shops might look like came from a shop in New York City. So this is much bigger and fancier than Papa's shop would have been. But it gives you an idea of some of the features, for example, the fabrics in the shelves on the wall, the pattern books for uh, the women to come look through pattern books and pick out the ones they wanted and so forth. So this would have been, um, although grander and larger, it would have been similar to the shop that Papa builds and that, um, that Hannah goes to work in. Hannah wants to sew dresses and she has to talk her father into this because her father thinks they should just sell dress goods and not bother with the actual making of the dresses. But Hannah's mother, who passed away several years earlier, was a dressmaker, taught Hannah very well, and Hannah wants to follow in her mother's footsteps. So in order to prove to her father that she can do this, at one point, she says to her father that she will make a dress and she has to do it within three days. Okay, she has three days to make a dress before the shop opens. And maybe you're thinking now, okay, three days to make a dress. I'm sure it's not that easy to sew a dress, or maybe some of you are actually, um, are actually seamstresses or seamsters and can sew. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's reasonable to be able to make a dress in three days. But remember that Hannah does not have a sewing machine. Okay, there were sewing machines by then. Her shop does not have one. Her mother's old shop in Los Angeles did have one. Okay, so there were sewing machines at this time, and it is Hannah's goal to one day have a sewing machine in their shop. But right now, she's sewing every stitch with a needle and thread by hand, and she is not making a dress like the kind we wear today. The dress that Hannah would have had to make in three days would have looked like one of these. Right? So there would have been at least two pieces, a jacket with a long overskirt and an underskirt. There would have been all these buttons and trimmings and ruffles. And at one point she's like, I'm not gonna do five rows of ruffles. Three rows is enough. <laughs> she's trying to save time. So, I mean, this one, this orange one, I don't even know how you sit down in that, right? Um, of course, there were the equivalent of fashion magazines back in those days. If you wanted to be very trendy and wear the latest, the most popular was called the Gaudy's Ladies Book. 
Okay, so it was kind of, it was everything. It was kind of the Vogue magazine and the Ladies Home Journal, and I don't even know if they have that anymore, but the Red Book and the, the you know, the, the L and the Marie Claire, it was all rolled up in one called the Gaudi's Ladies Book. So if you were trendy, you would have the Gaudi's. This is actually from 1880, from an issue in 1880. And this is what you would have been looking through to try to pick out what you would be wearing next. Right? So uh, one of the amazing things was that even in these new towns, these frontier villages, women would have dresses like this. Right? They would have them for visiting or for going to church on Sunday. And it was important to women like Ma to maintain standards, you know, cultural standards, even though they were living in a very muddy, dusty town with, you know, hardly any of what we would call culture in those days. Right? Um, they still uh, sewed themselves dresses like these and made themselves hats like these. Right? Of course, not everyone, but many of them. Okay. Um, Hannah, the book is called Prairie Lotus. Um, Lotus sounds like, to some people, like an exotic flower, maybe an Asian flower, and of course it is, but we have them here. We call them a different name. We call them water lilies. So that is what a lotus is, and probably many of you have seen them. Um, they don't grow on the prairie. So of course the title of the book is ironic. Um, they, they need water. And of course, prairies are, are by definition uh, semi-arid. They're very dry, very, very dry places. So um, Hannah's mother loved lotuses, lotus flowers from the Chinese tradition. They're a very important flower in many Asian traditions, um, including um, South Asian, like in India and other places like that, and Japan, China, Korea, Thailand. Lotuses are very revered flowers, have different meanings in different cultures. So Hannah's mother made the logo of her shop when she was alive and her dresses um, a pink lotus flower. Very simply sewn, for those of you who embroider, with five little lazy daisy stitches. So this is, a, this is a lotus that I embroidered myself using five lazy daisy stitches. And that is the logo that Hannah uses for, that her mother used and that she carries on the tradition of using that and sews it into the collar or into the cuff of every single dress she makes, kind of like a Nike swoosh before there was a Nike swoosh, right? Um, kind of like their trademark. So that's why the book is, is titled Prairie Lotus. And this, is, this would be the, the, the little flower that Hannah sews into every single dress that she makes. Okay, um, whenever I write historical fiction, um, I think about the history that we get, especially as children in schools, the history that we get through our education systems. And um, one of the questions that I always ask myself is you think about these big events in history, like westward expansion, like any event that we're taught of that has come down to us in history. And the question I'm always interested in is, who else was there? It's a pretty simple question, who else was there? Okay, so we are taught about the signing of the Declaration of Independence and that there were these men there and there's their signatures at the bottom. Who else was there? In the room, outside the room, outside the building? Right? And that's when you start to get the different lenses and the different perspectives on history, right? That's when you begin to dismantle the single story by asking, who else was there? When it comes to the history of the American West, here are a few titles that help answer that question. I've always already talked about Louise Erdrich's The Birch Bark House series. Lawrence Yep, one of our great Asian American writers for young people, in his, uh, he has a series of books about um, the Chinese in America, middle grade novels, and the two that are uh, contemporaneous with Prairie Lotus are called Dragon's Gate and The Traitor. So these two books are part of a series, but these are the two that take place at the same time as Prairie Lotus. Again, uh, contemporaneous with Hannah's story, Under a Painted Sky by Stacey Lee. That's YA rather than middle grade, so a little bit older. If you have graphic novel fans, Escape to Gold Mountain by um, David Wong. That's a, a graphic novel. Again, same era as Prairie Lotus. And Bad News for Outlaws 
the true story of Bass Reeves, U.S. Marshal. And um, this is a great book by Vonda Michaud Nelson and illustrated by R. Gregory Christie. That's going, uh, Bass Reeves is getting a movie soon. So a major release. So he's going to be in, uh, you know, more people are going to be learning about his story and his amazing story about how he was the number one U.S. Marshal of his time. So you picture a U.S. Marshal, what do you picture? You know, Bass Reeves, is, Bass Reeves' story is going to give you another lens. Um, there is an educator guide on my website for uh, Prairie Lotus. So the, the um, URL is at the bottom of the screen there, but of course you can just go to my website and get through it that way. There is also an extensive PowerPoint preservation, uh, presentation that includes videos and links and just a wealth of information about the Ocheti Shikoi tribe and nation. And that was done by my friend Andrea Page, who is an enrolled member of Ocheti Shikoi Hon um, Nation. She is the Hunk Papa Band, and she was one of my consultants on the book, and she has put together an amazing resource for educators. And I hope that if you are going to do this book with students, do Prairie Lotus with students, that you take the time to educate yourself on the, um, the uh, story of the Ocheti Shikoi Nation at this time. Um, and so uh, Andrea's presentation covers both history and contemporary life for the Ocheti Shikoi. Okay. Um, it's easier to teach history as single stories, right? It's more convenient. Um, it's messy and complicated and difficult to teach history from more than one perspective. Okay? And because of that, history textbooks do lean on single stories. That means that it's up to individual educators to provide that variety of lenses outside of the textbook for their students. Because once again, a single story is an incomplete story and an incomplete story can be a lie. I don't think there is an educator listening or even out there who says, no, no, I want to teach lies to children. Okay, <laughs> no, none of you say that, right? Hopefully, we all want to teach the truth to children. But as I said, the truth can be messy, right? And that's okay. We all have to learn. It's part of, like a huge part of like growing up, right? To, to understand that things are not as as binary as they might seem to be when growing up, that we have good and bad or good and evil or this and that, you know, that there's often a lot of mess that we have to try to synthesize and comprehend. Okay. I want to give you just a quick example of the different lenses that you might bring into the classroom. On the screen now are four kind of standard phases of American history, as I was taught when I was young, as many of us are still taught today, right? And these are, might be even like chapter headings or unit headings in our social studies textbooks, right? What are the different lenses? What are the different lenses for these kinds of, for, for, for these units of history? How do you dismantle, begin to dismantle the single story? Well, I still think that elements of this history, elements of what you see on the screen are what bind us as a culture and a nation. And yet, we can teach other lenses and greater truth, which is actually in the long run, although messy and difficult, going to help us, help strengthen us as a country and a culture in the long run. All right, so what does the discovery of the United States and its exploration, what does that look like through a different lens? It is actually the first attempt at genocide, at wiping out entire peoples, so that Europeans could settle here. Okay. Now, you can say, hey, wait a minute, I don't want to teach that. Well, that's part of the whole messy truth. Okay. What about our independence? Our independence from um, Britain and nation building. Building over the next the 100 years that followed, the nation that became the most powerful in the world. Okay. That's something we teach, right? Well, that was done through human trafficking and slavery. 
That was how we achieved such economic dominance. Yes, we were ambitious and smart and hardworking, but it would not have been possible without a thriving trade in human trafficking and slavery. Okay? We have to teach the history through both of those lenses. Westward expansion, manifest destiny, what I've been talking about and what is part of the story in Prairie Lotus. What is that? That is the second attempt at genocide, at invading nations and trying to wipe them off the planet. And when they couldn't succeed at that, giving them teeny, teeny bits of land and telling them they had to stay there. That is what exists for many native nations today. Our industrial and digital age, the age we're still living through now. What's the different lens there? One of many, one of many, this is only one of many, okay? There are a whole bunch of different lenses you can look at for these different phases. The industrial and digital age is environmental destruction and economic and social apartheid. We're pretty happy to use the apartheid for South Africa, the term apartheid, okay? It applies here too. It applies here in the United States too, and yet not something that's often taught in our schools. Okay? How do you see history through different lenses? You teach the one side of the screen, but you also teach the other side of the screen. And if you start to break it down and really think about this, all of these uh, phases of history have an incredible bearing on our contemporary current problems here in the U.S. today. If you don't deal with and teach and learn about the implications of human trafficking and slavery and the apartheid that followed that, okay, you're never going to begin to solve the problems that we have with racial injustice today. This is not ancient stuff that we're done with. It all has echoes, ramifications, resonances, real effects on our everyday lives right this minute. Educating our kids on the honest truth of our country's past is the key to its successful future. We educate them honestly. We tell them it's messy. And we say to them, we have screwed this up because we weren't taught the full history, but we're gonna give this to you now and when you grow up, you will figure it out. You will have the tools you need. We were not given the full truth. We were not given all the tools that we need to solve these problems. That's why things are kind of a mess now. Okay? We weren't taught for the example that the incredible economic growth and standard of living that we enjoy was the result of incredible environmental destruction ignoring decades and decades of the impact that plastic was having on our landscape and our atmosphere and our oceans. If we don't educate kids on something like that, how are they gonna to start to fix it? So that's a simple example. We have to educate them on the whole truth to give them the knowledge tools that they will need to help to solve these problems in the future. So, um, on my website, there are pages, individual pages for each of my books. And of course, this, there's one for Prairie Lotus with, again, the resources that I had talked about, um, more extensive than what I was able to present today. So please have a look at um, that if you, at the website and the various resources there if you are planning to teach this book to young readers. Um, and uh, thank you again for coming today. It's, um, it's a kind of a crazy time in our world and and any time that you take out to do some more learning of yourselves um, I think that every one of your students is fortunate that you are that kind of educator um, that kind of teacher who will take the time to learn yourself so you can pass on to them so I truly appreciate that and um, I thank you very much once again for attending today and I thank Bank Street and I wish you all happy reading Thanks very much, and please say hi to your students for me. Bye-bye.